In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. This morning's Gospel, my dear brethren, we hear of this important meeting between our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and this rich young man, where he asked the Lord, how shall I inherit eternal life? So we want to contemplate together for a few moments this morning about how serious are we about eternal life? Are we serious about our eternity? It reminds me of a story. It's a bit of a funny story, not a true story, but I hope that it can help us uh, to bring the point home about the importance of eternity. And I often think of the story that was retold by Fyodor Dostoevsky, who was a famous Russian writer in his book called The Brothers Karamazov. And it's about an old woman and an onion. As I said, it's not a true story, but it drives home the point that I would like to make concerning how we live our life on earth, that it will determine our eternity. So the story goes like this. That once upon a time, there was a peasant woman, and she was a very wicked woman. And she died and did not leave any single good deed behind. She kept all of her possessions to herself and was mainly a very selfish person. And the devils caught her and plunged her into the lake of fire. So her guardian angel stood there and wondered what good deed of hers that he could remember to tell God. And he remembered that she once pulled up an onion in her garden and said, and he said this to the Lord, he said this to God. And she pulled out this onion and she gave it to a beggar woman. And God answered, you take that onion then, hold it out to her in the lake and let her take hold and be pulled out. And if you can pull her out of the lake, let her come to paradise. But if the onion breaks, then the woman must stay where she is. So the angel ran to the woman and held out the onion to her. Come, said he, catch hold and I will pull you out. And he began cautiously pulling her out of the lake of fire. He had just pulled her right out when the other sinners in the lake, seeing how she was being drawn out, began catching hold of her so as to be pulled out with her. But she was a very wicked woman, as I said at the beginning, and she began kicking her. I'm, the, I'm to be pulled out, not you. It's my onion, not yours. So as soon as she said that, the onion broke and the woman fell into the lake and she is burning there till this day. So the angel wept and went away. Obviously, this is not a true story. It's doctrinally incorrect as we don't believe that after death, one can be moved from the lake of fire to the paradise. But it gives us an idea of how we should live our life not to be selfish and self-conceited, only caring about ourselves, not living by the scriptures, and not doing the good deeds according to our faith. So the point here, however, is about selfishness and only caring about ourselves and our earthly possessions and no thought about other people. And this was the, the case with this rich young man in this morning's gospel. So not caring for our eternal life and that of others and the importance of eternal life and how we should strive to be able to attain it. 
In this morning's gospel, there are many terms and imagery that are mentioned. The term good teacher, for example. Why do you call me good? The Lord says to the rich young man. And Saint Ephraim the Syrian says about this the following. He says the rich man called Jesus good as if he were offering him, offering Jesus, a favor, just as some favor others with honorary titles. This is how Saint Ephraim explains it. But the Lord wants to make it clear to all that no one is good but one showing them that the Father is good and as the only begotten Son, Christ our Lord is also good. And St. Basil of Caesarea says this. He says, It is a worthy endeavor to show concern over how one is to inherit eternal life. But what in fact proves that his whole intent was not to seek what is truly good but only to snoop about for what would please the crowd. Is this, when he had learned from the true teacher saving truths, he didn't write them in his heart. Yes, he, he learned them off by heart, but he didn't live them, didn't practice, continues to say. Nor did he put the teachings into practice, but he went off depressed, clouded by an instruction in greed. Again, this demonstrates moral inconsistency and self-contradiction, he says. He calls him teacher, but he won't do by the lessons that he taught. He calls him good, and what he, what he gave him, he threw away and would not follow to the end the instructions of the Lord to go and sell his goods and to carry his cross and to come and to follow the Lord. So a question for all of us is knowing the commandments sufficient to gain eternal life or was the man full of pride revealing his knowledge of the commandments in a conceited way? Knowing the commandments is good but this is only the first step, and we must then be able to fulfill these commandments in our daily living. Our Lord Jesus Christ loved him because he could see the potential in this young man. He had great potential. And if he was only able to overcome his love for the world and that he loved eternal life, more than his worldly position. So again, the question we need to all ask ourselves is how serious are we about eternal life? Some people leave it as at the end of their lives that they think about their eternity or at their old age to think about such matters. But let us ask, when does life actually end or eternal life begin for us. It begins when we leave this earth. And it reminds me of a, a true story that happened in one of our parishes in Perth in Australia. The monk priest who was serving there one evening decided to go and to visit the family. So they came, picked him up with their car, husband and wife. He went and spent some spiritual time with them. And on the way home, as they were driving him back to his residence, the street that they were driving on, it was dark, and it was a two-way street. And as they were driving along, all of a sudden, a van coming in the opposite direction steered out of the lane and came and hit them head on. Immediately, the husband who was driving passed away. His wife was sitting in the back seat. She was badly injured. And the monk also was very badly injured. And uh, he's still suffering till today, maybe more than 10 years now, many operations and so on. So 
life can end in an instant when we do not realize it. And this band was full of some young people that had been drinking in the pub and were drunk. And they not only affected this family, they affected the whole church, that parish, with the priest being injured for such a long time. So what I'm trying to say is that our life can end in a, in a moment, in an instant. And so we always have to be ready, always to be ready for that moment or that instant that we will meet with the Lord and with his Holy Mother, St. Mary, with the saints and the angels, and to be always prepared for our eternal life. So we need to begin these first steps of living eternal life while we are here on earth. And really, the monks had the right attitudes from the time of the great Saint Anthony and all of the rich history of monasticism, that they saw the world as worthless, that whatever they gained, that was nothing compared to the love for Christ. They saw their lives as mere vapor. As Saint James says in his epistle in chapter 4, verse 14, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow? For what is your life? He says, it is a, even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. How long are we going to live on this earth? 70, 80, 100, 120 years with all the advancement of medicine. How does this compare to eternity? It is only, as St. James says, a mere vapor that appears for a while and then vanishes away. So it is far better that we prepare for this eternal life now. And look at St. Anthony the Great as a really great model and example for us. A rich young man, his parents left him 300 acres of the finest fertile land in Egypt. And in his life story, it tells us one day he entered the church and heard the gospel being read that if you wish to be perfect, go and sell all of your goods, carry your cross and come and follow me. And the church would have been full that morning with, with faithful people. But he took it as a personal message and started to think, what is this life truly about? What is he going to really benefit from these acres that his parents left him? And he started to think of something far greater, this zeal and passion and love for Christ that was in his heart was far greater. And so he decided to sell everything, send his sister to a house for virgins, and he went out to blaze this path of monasticism that the whole world learned from him. And he saw that eternity was something that he could begin while he was living on earth and led this great monastic movement. And also, if you have heard of St. Macarius of Alexandria, in his life story, it says that one day he stood to pray and to contemplate about heaven. And he continued in this state for three days and three nights, contemplating on what eternal life would be like not caring for any needs of the body or food or drink or anything, and continued in this state for three whole days and nights until the devil got jealous of him and he burned the mat that he was standing on and only then did his thoughts return back down to earth and quickly got some water to put out the fire. But this shows you Maybe we'll never reach these lofty states of spirituality, but we should strive towards them to live a holy life, to be perfect, to be righteous, and to teach this diligently to our children. Another example is that of St. Moses, the strong, a man who began his life in a very worldly and earthly way giving his body every desire in gluttony, in food, in lustful desires, in crime, in so many things. And yet after having gained all of this, he still felt 
a void in his heart. He felt something was missing. There was a gap. There, there was a hole. And he started to search how this gap can be fulfilled. And he began to search for God and crying out to the Son, if you are God, reveal yourself to me. Until the Lord revealed himself to him and sent him out into the desert to meet with Saint Isidore and to repent of all of his sins and became known as Pigori is Oweb Abba Musi, the great Abba Moses, a great example for all of us, that he saw that all of this world at the end was useless, worthless, compared to living with the Lord Jesus Christ, and began to live this monastic life, and his relics we can find at Baramos Monastery in Skitis in Wadi Natrum. And also another example from the desert is that of Saint Bishoy. And we know that he would tie his hair to the ceiling of his cell so that he could spend all of the night in prayer and that when the body became weak that, and the head fell uh, heavy and he wanted to rest, his hair would pull him back up uh, to wake and to continue all night from sunset to sunrise, to continue living and being in the presence of the Lord. Again, very lofty examples, but they are a light to the world, an example for us to learn from of how to strive towards living a righteous and holy life to prepare our hearts and minds and souls for eternity. And in our modern history also, St. Pope Prolus VI, a man of prayer, a man of wonders, a man who prayed every day Vespers and liturgy every day and taught us the importance of, of liturgy and never cutting ourselves off from the body and blood of Christ that is offered to us in every liturgy. Because a little short period before this, at the turn of the century, not many cops were actually coming to church and not many people were attending liturgy and even far fewer were actually partaking of the Eucharist and of the body and blood of Christ. And so he really showed us and returned to us the glory and the blessing of being part of the church as the faithful standing around the table of the Lord and partaking of his body and blood. And also Saint Habib Gerges, the archdeacon, care, he did not only care for his salvation, but in fact he cared for salvation and the knowledge of the whole church through education, through the sacraments, and through much more. And sometimes I wonder to myself, if God did not send Saint Archdeacon Habib Gerdes at that time, at the turn of the 20th century, which was an age of darkness in the life of the church, why it was an age of darkness was because there was no patriarch or bishop or priest or deacon or lay person that was preaching and teaching in the church. Sunday school that now is something we take for granted did not exist at that time. There was no theological college to train priests to be educated and learned in all of the faith and theology in order to be able to lead the congregations. A very, very sad and difficult period in the life of the church. And as Pope Shenouda III of blessed memory said of him, that he was truly a light in this darkness, that God sent him at that time, that he began to educate himself. He began to read so much in the library of the Patriarchate, and he was the first graduate from the seminary in 1898, and then began to work in the Sunday school movement and establish curricula, and then became the dean of the seminary. It is a long history but a very important one to know that not only he cared for his own eternal life, 
but he wanted the whole Coptic faithful to also know their faith deeply in order that they can also work on their salvation and their eternity. A bright example in our modern history. The rich young ruler that we read about this morning was so proud and he was so stuck on his earthly possessions. And the Lord Jesus Christ asked him to sell everything and to be able to gain treasures in heaven. He didn't say eternal life, but he spoke to him in a language that he understood, telling him that he would gain treasures in heaven, meaning eternal life. So again, is knowing the commandments enough or is it just the first step towards eternal life? How do we live these commandments every day and teach them diligently to our children? Because as parents, you have a critical and vital role, not only to care for your own salvation, but for these precious gifts that God has given to you in your children and you are the first educators of your children and have a critical role to play in also caring for their own salvation. So what is our daily walk with the Savior like? Do we communicate? Do we dialogue with him daily? How often? St. Paul speaks about prayer without ceasing. And the church gives us all of the means and the methods to always to communicate with the Lord through the seven hourly prayers of the Agbeya, for example. In the Jesus prayer that we could repeat hundreds and thousands of times throughout the day, my Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Remembering the name of the Lord, remembering that we are sinners, remembering that we are in need of God's mercy, just remembering this in our mind, in our heart, in our spirits, will keep us clean and pure and holy. And also through practically fulfilling the commandments, like visiting the sick, if we know someone that is in hospital, someone that is in need of some assistance, that we do not delay in helping others and not being selfish to only care for ourselves, to live truly a life of repentance, to learn how to give thanks at all times. And at the end of the gospel, it speaks that there is also persecution. Don't think that living with the Lord means that your life is going to be smooth. But there will be times where we need to carry our cross. And we see this very example uh, very clearly in the life of the church in Egypt. Till today, the church is being persecuted. Till today, churches are being burned. Till, till today, Christians are losing their lives. We all know of the 21 martyrs of Libya that were a light to the whole world, not just for Copts. And Abraham were amazed at how these people that maybe were not deep theologians, but yet how they were praying to the last breath in their life, knowing that in one instant they will be with the Lord. In 2016, I was inside of the Botrusea church when two hours after the bombing happened. And you cannot imagine what the scene was like with the pews that were destroyed I could look all the way to the heavens. The roof had been blown out of the church. And, after, and the blood of the martyrs was all splattered over the walls of the church. And a few days later, I was given permission to visit the confessors in the hospital and to visit some of the injured. And speaking with them, I was edified and learned so much from them. How these people, in their suffering and pain, how they said to me, we forgive these people that did this evil crime against us. And we pray for them that they may repent from this evil work. 
What a great inspiration and example for all of us of this strong faith of the Copts and their true love for the Lord Jesus Christ, even among the faces of persecution that they went through. And we may be surprised in eternity of some who we expected to be there and are not. And also perhaps the opposite is true, as Christ said, that the first will be last and the last will be first. May the blessing of this morning's gospel be with us all and that we may contemplate, and maybe when we go home today, we spend some time to read this gospel again from St. Mark chapter 10 and, and think about how can we practically, every single day of our lives, prepare our hearts and minds and souls for eternal life. And glory be to God forever. Amen.